Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this Christmas day. Haven't said that often in my ministerial career, but we're glad to have you here. We'll play that this will be a time of blessing and for those worshiping at home, we give you a warm welcome and pray that your time with us will be part of the Christmas experience for you. It was good last night to have a Christmas Eve service with it felt more like Christmas Eve uh, than it has for the last several years with COVID. Uh, a lot of families, a lot of people from the uh, far reaches coming to visit with family and a lot of people we just didn't know. So that was nice. That was nice. There are, uh, just to remind you that next Sunday we'll be meeting around 10 for brunch down in the fellowship hall. Uh, people are invited to bring something and we'll... Uh, share what's there and then we'll have a service around table um, about 10 30. are there other announcements to share this morning peace of christ be with you Join me in the call to worship. We recount the gracious deeds of God, all the praiseworthy acts the Lord has done for us. Praise God for coming to dwell among us in that Emperor. Praise God for the good news of Jesus, the pioneer of our salvation. Praise God who is present with us still, lifting us up and carrying us. God's glory shines in the hand of the Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
even as the heavenly hosts sang of your glory in the night skies over Bethlehem, even as the stars shone in the heavens and sheep and cattle gathered in that light, so we gather, young and old together, to recount all that you have done for us in mercy and steadfast love. No tyrant's threat or deadly act can destroy the dreams and visions you have placed within us, for you have drawn us close. With all creation, we praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Amen. This morning we do need to finish the lighting of our Advent wreath as we did last night, as we come to remember that this indeed is the day of Christ's birth. There were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of a great joy for all the people. For to you was born a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. We light the Christ candle to remind ourselves that Christ is born. And as we continue in our worship together this morning, we come on a day of joy, but also knowing that some of us carry burdens, hurts from others who have inflicted pain upon us or pain for the knowledge that we've inflicted hurts on others or that we've, not, that we've neglected God's love and neglected God's word. So let us join now in that time of private and silent prayer as we offer up our prayers to God, our prayers of confession. Let us join in our silent prayers. We all know the stress that we're sometimes under as we carry heavy burdens. It's like carrying a, a heavy rock. It weighs us down and when we set it down, there is relief. There is a sense of accomplishment. There's a sense of hope. There's a sense of renewed energy. That unburdening is given to us by a gift of God. So may we celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ, that in him we are forgiven. Amen. This was a time for children, but you see, I've, I've, I've sort of suspected that kids weren't going to be here this morning. They would be previously occupied or asleep. So this is a time to share with kids of all ages and people of all ages. And one of the things I'd like to have us think about this morning and, and talk about together is to imagine that we're approaching God with a very special prayer. And it's a prayer that comes from the depth of our hearts and touches us and touches others in, in a special way. So many times we have long petitions. We pray for this or that or the other thing. We pray for family or friends or for the condition of the world. But if you had one thing to choose today to lift up to God, one prayer, it could be a prayer of joy, it could be a concern, 
If you had one thing to say to God this morning, what would that be? I think for me, it's seeing the conflict that still exists in the world and in among peoples, the anger, the road rage, the political divisions. And if I had one prayer that I knew would go right to the ear of God and God would act on it, would be a prayer for peace, peace between peoples. So what, what might be a prayer that would be on your lips this morning, either of joy or concern or hope? What would you pray for this morning? Yes, Carol. Carol's prayer is to thank God for the gift of memory. Uh, Christmas brings about all those memories of good and maybe not so good Christmases in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Sandy? Sandy's thankful for her health, physical and mental. Annie? You're praying for the family members who can't be with you? Is that what you said? Those that aren't able to celebrate like we do. Yes. Yeah. Other prayers that might be on your lips to God's ear. Yes, Sue. I have a very, very dear friend who is going through a rough patch in life. And I pray that this person finds a little rest, a little peace in his life. Good friend. Good friend of Sue's is going through a difficult time and she prays for his peace, his joy. Yeah. people would look outside ourselves and think about others. Yeah. Did I see? Oh, Sandy, I'm sorry. I would pray for an explosion of faith in God in the world, in my family. An explosion of faith in God in the world and in family. Let's pray together. Lord, from our lips to your ears, from our hearts to your heart, may our prayers show the love we have. May our prayers help hasten the day when these prayers will be answered. In Christ's name, amen. amen. This is the time then we share joys and concerns. We've already done that a little bit um, in this. Um, but are there additional joys and con concerns you'd like to lift up this morning? And uh, Gary has asked to remember uh, his friend Leo's aunt who passed away after struggling with illness. 
other joys or concerns? Yes. Sandy's got a new kitty cat at home. I know it's going to bring her a lot of joy. And we're thinking about our friend Jean this week. We think about Jean and her loss and uh, Sandy and her gain. I don't know if it's a joy or a concern, but with a new cat in the, in the house. We had a cat that uh, loved to climb the curtains. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Annie? What's the date? Uh, January 9th. January 9th. Please all stay off the road. Annie's going <laughs> to <Annie's gonna laughs> take her driver's test. Yes. Pray for your dad, too. <laughs> Other joys or concerns. I see my family this afternoon. Good for you. Family, yeah. Good. Both Kylie students are home safe. Good. That's always a concern. Yes. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts you give us. Thank you for this gathering on Christmas Day. Thank you for the gift of your word and for all those ways that you touch our lives through family, friends, acquaintances, cards, poems, hymns, carols, even Christmas specials in their abundance. Thank you for the way you work in our world and for the gift of Jesus Christ. I'll be with those who need your care. We especially lift up those who mourn the loss of a loved one, those who are sick or confined to a bed or a room. We pray for those who struggle with the cold weather because they're homeless or living in inadequately heated homes and apartments. Be with those who are hungry those who are hurting, those who need a sense of your peace. So walk with us in this journey of faith. Help us to be your disciples who show that love through the way we care for others. And Lord, give us your presence. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson for this morning comes from Psalm 98. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And our second lesson comes from John, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own and his own people, did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. May God bless to our understanding. This is the reading and hearing of God's word. A few weeks ago, we were talking about this service and how we could make it a little different, a little special. And Carol Foster said to me, I have a story I'd like to share, but it's long. And it's probably too long for the service. And I said, well, how long is it? And she said, oh, yeah, about this long. I said, that's, that's, a, that's perfect for a sermon. Gives me a break and Gehazla has an opportunity for us to hear a special story. So Carol. And I have to say how nice to hear Pastor Dave reading the scriptures. He has a special touch with them. I just have to get a little friend here. Pay special attention to our nativity set. It's a pretty important part of this story. Do you ever think about how sheep are curly? You will before this story is over. And I just want to say to Sandy and Dorothy, God bless you. They heard this story just the week before last at the fortnightly club luncheon. And here they are this morning. So the village children 
called him Mr. Gloomy. Now, it was a good name for him, even though it's not nice to call people names. But it was apt. His real name was Toomey, Jonathan Toomey. And you never saw him smile or laugh. When he was outside in the village, he was always grumbling and griping and muttering and sputtering. The church bells rang too loudly. The birds sang too shrilly. The children played too loudly. Now, let me tell you a little about Jonathan Toomey. Jonathan was a woodcarver, and the people said, many people, that he was the best woodcarver in the valley. Jonathan spent his days at his workbench carving beautiful shapes out of blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood. And at night, after supper, he sat in a straight back chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the fire. Jonathan Toomey was not an old man, but if you saw him walking, bent forward, head down, you would think he was an old man. You wouldn't see his eyes clear as an August sky and you certainly wouldn't see the dimple in his chin because his long, shaggy, untrimmed beard covered it completely. There was a reason why Jonathan Toomey was so sad, but none of the village people knew that. You see, a few years ago, when he was younger and full of life and love, Jonathan Toomey's wife and baby got sick. They died three days apart. It's the days before hospitals and skilled doctors and medicines. And when this happened, Jonathan Toomey loaded all of his belongings into a wagon and he traveled until his tears stopped. And he settled into a little cottage at the end of the village. And that's where he was when we see him this morning. That morning though, there was a knock on his door. Grumbling and griping, Jonathan Toomey went over and opened his door and there stood a young woman with a little boy. Good morning, she said. I am the widow McDowell. This is my son, Thomas. We're new to your village. I'm seven, piped up Thomas, and I can whistle. Whistling is pish posh, muttered Jonathan to me. Well, said the widow McDowell, we're sorry to bother you, but I need you to carve something for me. I had a set of Christmas figures that my grandfather made for me when I was just a little boy, little girl, I'm sorry. And I've had them every Christmas. When we moved, I was sure I had them with us, but I cannot find them. I have prayed for a miracle, <coughs> said Jonathan to me. Miracles are pish posh. Well, she said, I really want those Christmas figures. Could you carve them for me? I will, he said. Oh, thank you so much, she said. It would be wonderful. And with that, Jonathan Toomey turned and shut his door. About a week went by. And a morning came, and there was a knock on his door again. 
muttering and grumbling, Jonathan got up from his workbench and went over and opened the door, and there stood the widow McDowell with Thomas. I'm sorry to bother you, she said, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch you work. He thinks he'd like to be a woodcarver when he grows up. I'll be quiet, Thomas promised. You won't even know I'm here. Jonathan Toomey opened the door wider and motioned for them to go in. He pointed to a stool by his workbench and he said to, John, to Thomas, you sit there, no talking, no jiggling, nothing. So Thomas sat down on the stool. The widow McDowell put a nice plate of fresh warm cornbread on the table. And then she went over to a rocking chair near the fireplace and sat down and took out her knitting. But before she could get it unpacked, Jonathan Toomey whirled on her. He said, no one sits in that chair. She got up and moved to the straight back chair. Well, Thomas was as good as his word. He sat there all afternoon as silent as could be, watching fascinated as Jonathan Toomey worked with his carving knife and a block of wood. But at one point, Thomas couldn't be silent any longer, and he said, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Toomey, may I ask a question? Mm. He thought that meant yes. Is that my sheep you're carving, Thomas asked. Mm. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Toomey, but you're carving it wrong. <laughs> Jonathan Toomey's carving knife stopped. The widow McDowell's knitting needles stopped. And it was silent for a moment. You see, said Thomas, it's a wonderful sheep. And, and it's nice and curly, like you know, we told you it needed to be. But my sheep looked happy. <gasps> Pish posh, declared Jonathan to me. Sheep are sheep and they cannot look happy. Mine did, insisted Thomas. After all, the baby Jesus came to his barn to get born. And he was so happy. Thomas decided he better quit while he was ahead. And he was silent the rest of the afternoon. And when the church bells chimed six in the evening, Jonathan grumbled that they were ringing so loudly. Hadn't they just been run? And the widow McDowell stood up and said, it is time we leave, Thomas. Well, that night, after he ate his supper of boiled potatoes and cornbread, Jonathan Toomey went back, and he stared at the sheep that he had been carving, picked up his knife, and he picked up the wood, and he worked until his eyelids were drooping. A few days later, in the morning, he was already working at his workbench, and there was a knock on the door. <clears throat> He opened it, and there stood the widow McDowell and Thomas. May we come in and watch again today, Thomas asked. I promise I'll be quiet. I won't bother you. They came in. Jonathan went right back to his workbench without any more attention to his visitors. The widow McDowell put a plate of warm, <laughs> sticky buns on the table. He didn't appear to notice them, but Jonathan observed, the tea kettle is still warm. So the widow McDowell put a plate of sticky bun and a cup of tea over in front of Jonathan Toomey on his workbench, just resting her hand gently on his shoulder for a moment. And then she sat down and went back to work. He didn't say anything, but a few minutes later, if you'd been there, you would have noticed that the plate and the cup were both empty. 
As for Thomas, he tried to eat his sticky bun quietly, but you know, when you're seven years old and you've got a nice warm sticky bun, it's hard not to be smacking your lips and enjoying it. The afternoon passed and Jonathan felt this sneeze coming on and he stuffed his fingers under his nose to stop it. And his leg started itching, but he counted to 20 to make it go away. But finally, he had to say something. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Toomey, may I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Is that my cow that you're carving? <sighs> yes. Well, it is a beautiful cow. It's probably the most beautiful cow I've ever seen. But, but, said Jonathan to me, my cow looked proud. How can a cow look proud? Jonathan Toomey exclaimed. Well, he did, said Jonathan, because after all, there he was in the barn where Jesus was born. Nothing more was said that afternoon. There was the clicking of the knitting needles and the carving on the wood of Jonathan Toomey's knife. And when the bells chimed at six o'clock, he grumbled and the widow McDowell declared for Thomas it was time to go. That night, Jonathan Toomey had a sticky bun and a boiled potato for his supper. Then he picked up his carving, the wood and the knife, and he worked away at that cow until his eyelids drooped. A few days went by and Jonathan Toomey was already at work in the morning when there was a knock on his door. He kind of brushed off his shirt a little bit and then kind of hurried to the door. Good morning, the widow McDowell said with Thomas. Is it all right if we come today and watch? He's insistent, she said with a smile. She had brought a plate of fresh baked molasses cookies. And as the wood carver went back to work at his workshop bench, Thomas settled himself on the stool and she spread a plate with the molasses cookies and some tea and went back to her knitting. And that afternoon, Jonathan did his very best to concentrate on the carving, and Thomas worked so hard at being quiet. <laughs> he felt like he was going to sneeze at one point, but he held his breath until his whole face turned red. And then he was sure his legs were going to twitch, but he held them so firm that they fell asleep. And when he couldn't stand it any longer, he said, <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Toomey, is that the angel you're carving? <sighs> yes, said Jonathan Toomey. Do you want to tell me right now what I'm doing wrong? Oh, it's going to be a lovely angel, said Thomas. I can tell, but I can also tell it's a very, very important angel. How do you make an angel look important? Jonathan Toomey demanded. I don't know, said Thomas, but I know you'll know how to do it because you're the best wood carver there is. And when the church bells chimed at six o'clock, I'm not sure Jonathan Toomey even heard them. He was working so intently. The widow McDowell and Thomas left and Jonathan Toomey had his supper of a warm molasses cookie and some boiled potato. And that night he sat with that block of wood that would be an angel and he stared at it. 
and he used a piece of charcoal, made some sketches on a piece of brown paper, and then he worked and he worked all night long until he, his eyes would not stay open. The next day, the widow McDowell and Thomas arrived at the door, and Jonathan Toomey seemed to be listening for the knock on the door. He smoothed down his hair and brushed his beard and hurried to the door and opened it and showed them in. The widow McDowell had a bouquet of pine boughs and holly branches with red berries. And Thomas, more excited than ever, they came in. And while Jonathan was working and Thomas was sitting watching, she scrubbed the kitchen table and she found a cloth that was embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies and she put it on the table and she found a jar and she filled it with water and put the pine boughs and the holly branches in it and set it right in the center. And smiling and nodding, she then sat down with her knitting. Now you know, the middle of that afternoon, Thomas couldn't be still a minute longer, and he said, Mr. Toomey, may I please ask a question? Mm hmm Well, is that the wise men you're working on? Yes, it is, said Jonathan Toomey. And I'll also be working on the figure of Joseph. Now, do you want to just tell me right now how they should look? Well, the wise men, said Thomas, they were going to see the baby Jesus and they wore their most important, most beautiful robes. Joseph, he didn't have beautiful robes, but he looked so serious, like he had the largest job in the world. Thank you, Thomas. And then Thomas said, I have another question. Yes, said Jonathan. I have a question too. Do you always talk this much? <laughs> Mom says, I do, said Thomas. She said, I could learn the virtue of silence from you. Whoa, you could see Jonathan's face turning pink under his whiskers. And the widow McDowell's face turned as red as the scarf that she had been knitting. Yes, it is, said Jonathan. Then, could you teach me how to carve, Thomas begged. Ah. Oh. But he put down his work, and he picked up a little block of wood and a small knife, and he turned to Thomas and he said, you will carve a bird. Oh, I hope it's a robin, said Thomas. I love robins. Jonathan put his hands over Thomas's, and he showed him how to lop off the corners and smooth the wood. And they were like that the rest of the afternoon. Jonathan's hands over Thomas's, working on that bird. When the bells chimed at the end of the day, Jonathan honestly didn't even notice them. The widow McDowell stood up and she said, it is time for us to go home. And it was on the way to the door that Jonathan noticed the kitchen table with the cloth and the bouquet, and he looked at Widow McDowell and with a questioning look, and she said, I found that cloth in the drawer under the cupboard. I thought it looked so pretty. Don't ever open that drawer, Jonathan declared. With that, they got up and they left. That night, Jonathan Toomey didn't have any supper. 
because he knew what was next to carve. The baby and the mother. Now, he knew these were the most important figures to go in this. He sat and he thought, and he thought, and he thought, and he thought. He got some brown paper and his charcoal pencil and he tried to draw a sketch of the baby and it wouldn't work. And he crumpled up the paper and threw it on the floor. He tried the mother, same thing. He crumpled the paper and threw it, and pretty soon he had a little pile of drawings on the floor. So he took a piece of wood and he tried carving, but that knife would not do anything he wanted it to. And he threw the wood into the fireplace. And he sat there with his head in his hands. And he sat like that until midnight when the church bells chimed for the Christmas Eve service. And he finally got up and he went over to that drawer that he had already yelled at the Widow McDowell about opening. And he opened it and he took out that cloth and then he pulled out a rough woolen shawl and a lacy handkerchief and then a white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. And finally, under all of that, he took a picture, a charcoal drawing of a woman in a rocking chair holding a baby. And she was looking at him with such love. And he was looking at her, reaching for her with a smile on his face. And Jonathan Toomey clasped that picture to his chest and he sat there and rocked and two tears slid down into his beard. And he finally got up and he put the picture on his workbench, picked up his knife and wood and it all came together. And he worked the rest of the night. And then as he got up from his workbench, he noticed that there on the table were two packages that Thomas and the widow McDowell had left for him. He opened them up. One was a bright red knitted scarf. He put it immediately around his neck. And the other one, you can guess, a lopsided robin. And he couldn't keep his mouth from twitching as he unwrapped it. And he put it up in the center of his mantle after wiping the mantle with his sleeve. And when the daylight came with the morning, Jonathan had a box stuffed with straw. And he carried it over to the widow McDowell's house and knocked on the door. Mr. Toomey, what a surprise. Merry Christmas. Would you like to come in? He took the box that he had brought and he set it on her table and he started unpacking it. He unpacked the curly sheep and the happy looking cow, the proud angel and wise men dressed in their best robes and Joseph standing stern and tall, and Mary and her beloved baby. Thomas and the widow McDowell were just staring in awe at the figures. They were so beautiful. Well, that morning, Jonathan went to the Christmas services at the church with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And for the first time, any of the people in the village, if they looked, got to see those blue eyes that Thomas had, that Jonathan had. And they even got to hear him laugh. 
they never heard Jonathan Toomey grumble again. Merry Christmas. Christmas gifts come in many, many forms. Thank you, Carol. I invite you now to join me in our affirmation of faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We do invite you to take a poinsettia if you had reserved one, and if you have not reserved one, take one, take two. We all want them to find good homes. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be in the body this, this Christmas day, this coming new year, and indeed throughout the rest of the days of your life. Amen.